Good morning, everybody. If you would, make your way to your seats. We have a few announcements this morning as you all finish up the chatting. All right. Mary Jean's not done talking, it's okay. Well, just for the rest of you, just as a reminder, today is our session meeting. So if you are a member of session, please plan to stay afterward. We have a few items of business to attend to. As a fun announcement, next week is finally our church in the park. We'll be at Round Hill Park, and this is at the Harmony House again this year. Last year, we were there for the first time, and we're going back there again this year. So if you're attending, just keep driving. When you get in Round Hill Park, keep going up and up. Then you'll start actually going down, and you'll know you're heading in the right direction, and it's the last one. So you really can't miss it. But that is next week, and it's at 11 a.m. We're going to be switching back to our later time. So if you get there at 10, you just get to help set up. So that's a win-win for us, but the actual service starts at 11. You can bring an item of food to share, but I'm sure there will be plenty of food there if you cannot bring one. And if you're watching online, we welcome anyone to join us, as this is going to be with the AME Church and Bethesda Olivet, as it has been before. Next Monday, not tomorrow, but two Mondays from now, is our Back to School Festival. This is where we're going to be giving away those 100 backpacks that we have with supplies in them. We also are going to have a coupon book available from all the different stores in town. Uh, we have lots of things that we'll be doing there, particularly handing out some food, handing out the backpacks, making sure everything runs smoothly. So if you can volunteer for the event, please let me know. We're looking for a few people in particular to help run the food and to help give out the backpacks. I do have a few of you in mind to ask directly, so if I come up to you, that's probably what I'm going to be asking about. But if you can also just attend and just tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell people you know with children, we're hoping to spread as much word as possible, and we do have a lot of publicity out there. So hopefully word of mouth and other things and the internet is getting across. Also, as we are continuing to move through our needs for children in ministry, as we are finishing our children's sermon, I do want to remind you that we are looking for a children's director. Um, if you or someone you know has a passion for children, they can help attend our church's needs in this time as we continue to grow and they continue to address the children in our community. You can find information about that position on our website. You can also give us a call or just talk to me about what is entailed. Find the Bible study will be Tuesday at 10 a.m. as normal. And beyond that, do we have any other announcements today? Yes, Barry. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, a book was released last Wednesday, Life on a Mississippi by Richard Buck. Mm -hmm. And I'm in it. Oh. In the index. You're in it. Yeah. Ooh. He, he, uh, he takes people to characters. My character is like uh, a hillbilly Jedi master in the Mon River. Oh, wow. That's impressive. Yeah, well, but tell me about it. Which is pretty neat. All right. It's a good history on the flat boats and the public the country. Ah, Elizabeth was a big part of that, so that's interesting. So. Yeah, he's a bestseller, so I could be on the bestseller list. Ooh, our local celebrity. Yeah. Well, be sure to talk to Barry after church about that, so that's very exciting. Book signing, book signing. Book signing. We'll have to schedule that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other announcements? Then seeing none, let us come together in reflection and join our worship by coming together with our morning prelude. Would you pray with me? Lord, we gather our hearts together this morning to worship you, to focus on your call in our lives, particularly as we close this series on children. 
Help us embrace the children in our lives and help us reflect on the truth that each of us is a child of yours. Help us be an open community. Help us feel your presence this morning. Your spirit come alive in our hearts. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you please stand and join in singing with me, Draw Me Nearer, verses 1, 2, and 4, our first hymn this morning. our time of prayer, we join first in our time of confession, knowing that each of us is a child of God, that we come to him, full of grace and mercy for us, as though children that have stumbled and fallen. He picks us up and helps us continue onward. Would you join me as we pray together the prayer of confession found in your order of worship? God, our judge, forgive us for the ways we cause others to stumble. You call us to lives of grace yet we so easily turn to judgment. Remind us of your many warnings to seek first the care of others over our own well-being. May your spirit change our hearts to be a people who embody your love and purpose. Amen. The love of the grace of God has been given to you, and you're held in the assured power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name you are all forgiven. Would you please stand and join me as we come together in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, this day. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits in the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We turn our minds in time of prayer. I know that on Carol Jean's mind is what occurred at Chautauqua, so we'll be praying for all those involved there. But are there any other prayer requests this morning? Yes. Yes, Sarah finished her chemo treatments, but she won't get the results till the end of September, so she's going to try to go back to school and teach. 
Okay. Awesome. So the chemo's finished, and we're hoping for good results. Wonderful. We'll keep keeping keep strong. Any other? Uh, oh, here. Um, the little three-year-old, that um, little Adeline, who had that little, she has that brain stem thing, and she had that little thing that she had. Anyway, that, she's been taking off some of the steroids, so she's coming back um, to more normality. But they put her on them. Make a wish was there with her then too to see if there's something they can do with her as well. So um, we'll see how that all works out. But continue to pray. And if you put her on the prayer list too, I can talk to I can do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Mary Jean? My brother Bob and my niece Robin. Bob and Robin. Rolls off the tongue. Any other? <laughs> Seeing none, would you please join me as we gather our hearts together in prayer as a community? <laughs> Gracious and holy Lord, we gather today seeking your presence. We gather today to seek the divine, to enter into something holy, to set apart a time and space where your presence fills us. We know that you are always near with us. But Sunday mornings can be a time where we truly feel your presence. Where as we gather as a community, we can come to experience and know you more fully. To worship you and lift our voices to the one who loves us and made us. To see truths and have hope renewed in our hearts as the worries and fears and struggles of this world seek to overcome us. We pray, Lord, that you'd come upon us powerfully. We pray because we truly believe that it can change things. Help us, Lord, to trust in you. Help us, Lord, to know of your mercy and grace when prayers may not always be answered the way we seem, when travesties continue to occur. Help us remember the truth that you are a God who will seek justice, that you are a God who will, in the end of time, renew all things, wipe away each tear, that you are a God that chose to die with us and not abandon us, that you care for each of us, particularly those who are the weakest, the outcasts, the children, the weak. So Lord, give us eyes and a heart to see the world as you see, to be a people of God reawakened to the truths of who we are, your body of Christ in this world, to bring a change, to be the people that stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. To offer a hand to those who are struggling, stumbling, lost in sin. Be a people of grace and love. We pray that these truths would extend to each church around this globe, that we would enact change, that we would seek ends to violence, justice for those who have been oppressed, help for those who have no food on their table, help for those who have no home. We pray, though, for those who are persecuted, we pray for your church that's persecuted. We pray that you give us strength, that a divine change would occur. We pray that we would seek the lost and the weary and know that you give us all that we need to do these things, that we need not be special, that we need not have riches or power that this world sees, but instead rely on the one true source of strength, you. So Lord, we pray for our community today. We focus our hearts now in this time upon our city, where we dwell, where this church has been planted. We pray for your blessings on our families and our friends and our neighbors, that you would be with those who are not among us, the strangers, the outcasts, the homeless, and the shut-ins. We pray your mercies upon the incarcerated and the drug addicted and those who are struggling in our community. We pray that they would know a moment of your love and your care. We focus our hearts on the children in our midst and the children in the homes that surround us, many of whom do not have food except for what is provided to them from schools, many of whom do not know 
having have two parents at home as both have to work to simply provide a shelter for them, many of whom do not even have two parents. So Lord, we pray for your love to extend to them. Help us be a people that can stand up for them, to seek them and be there for them. Where there is sorrow, sickness, or suffering, Lord, send your spirit to bring healing and change and comfort. We pray over the travesties we've witnessed, for the continued struggles of wars around the world, for harm that befalls others, for events like those at Chautauqua, where we cannot comprehend the violence in other people's hearts. So Lord, we pray for your mercy to come into those situations, your strength to stand up and challenge it, and to heal those who've been wounded. Lord, we thank you that Sarah has been able to finish her chemo treatment. But we pray that she continue to get stronger, renewed health, and that the results would come back positively, that this has been a successful treatment for her. We pray for Adeline as she continues to go through her own treatment. We pray for a miracle to occur through your strength, which we can't always know will occur. But we do know that she rests in your arms that no matter the outcome, she is a beloved child of yours, and that you will always be with her. Lord, we pray for Bob and Robin, and we pray for the many names on our prayer list. And we pray in this time for all those things that weigh upon each of our hearts, the things that distract us, the things that give us anxiety and fears for events to come or events that have happened. So Lord, help us speak to you in this time. For all these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Seeking to do the good that we're called to do in the world, we gather the gifts that God has already blessed us with. And as a reminder, we are continuing to raise funds for our Back to School Festival downstairs in our lobby. And you can give online as well directly through our website. Let us give to the Lord generously the gifts he's given to us. You don't have a ton of things in common with God. But there is one thing. You speak. So to see, God spoke light into existence with his words. I wonder what you could speak into existence with your words this week. I wonder what kind of love you could speak into your marriage that feels like it's in neutral. I wonder what kind of courage you could speak into the heart of a child who's hurting. I wonder what kind of peace you could speak into your broken friendship. What kind of hope you could speak into your own weary soul. I want you to know that the most powerful words you're going to speak this week is probably not going to be on a stage or a conference call or closing the deal with a client that you want. The most powerful words you're going to speak is probably just with one or two people listening, maybe zero. It's totally possible that the most powerful sentence you'll say this week is a thoughtful text message that you send to a friend who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's the apology email that you finally get the courage to send It's the whispered prayers through tears in the middle of a dark night. Powerful words aren't just for preachers who stand behind pulpits. They're for parents who stand next to bunk beds. Speak life if they're kids. For spouses who share hopes and dreams during pillow talk, and not criticism. For teenagers who stand up to bullies, stand up for the uncool kids. Your tongue is so small, but so powerful. 
Your tongue is telling a story. prayer of thanksgiving for our offering. Holy Spirit, bless these offerings to make our church a place of welcome to all who seek your presence. Amen. And would you please join me in singing our second hymn today, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. So I'm going to need a volunteer in a few minutes, and it's going to have to be one of you three. So who'd like to volunteer? <laughs> no one. Well, I'll let you volunteer in a second, OK? When I say get up and come over here. <coughs> oh, it's too late. It came up too late. I already gave it to her. <laughs> Sorry. Next time. Next time I need a volunteer. Well, I have a question for you. In the Bible, Jesus is with his friends. And they've been with him a long, long time. And they're thinking, you know what? We got this. We understand how things are going. And they came with, to Jesus with a really interesting question. They asked, who do you think is the greatest? That's kind of a weird question to ask Jesus. But they asked him that. Now, what do you think makes someone great? What do you think? How big they are? Yeah. No? OK. How about how much money they have? Yeah. Wow, no? OK. What about how smart they are? Yes, okay, I got him on that one. Yes, you have to be smart. That's what makes you great. All right, all right. I tricked him on one of them. What about if you could fly? No, okay. 
Interesting. Well, this is where you're going to come along. Can you stand right next to me? Right here? Come on. You got it. Right here. Yeah? There you go. What Jesus said is he took a little one like this, and he said, in the kingdom of God, the littlest is the greatest. The first is last, and the last is first. Whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. See, what Jesus was trying to teach him, you can go back to mom now if you want, is that to be great in his kingdom isn't about power, strength, wealth, money, how smart you are, how big you are, how old you are. It's just the simple fact that you're beloved by God. And the thing is, you guys might understand this now, because adults love you and everything, and you're getting bigger, but when you get big like adults, we tend to forget that. And we seek money and power and strength. So what I'd encourage you little children to remember is that it's not how good you are, or how smart you are, or how big you are that makes you belong in the church. It's the simple fact that you're here. Would you all pray with me today? Dear God, Help me know I am loved. Amen. All right. And I have these for you again. You can go in the back and try coloring with it. I think you'll do a great job. Can you color for me, Evie? Yeah. Oh, that's true. One more, Julie. One more. Yeah, since Eric wants that out there. One for you. All right. We turn now to our final scripture readings, the first of which is in Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 13. Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone. And none of us die for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the living the dead. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment to one another. Instead, make up your minds not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. And now, for the words of Christ on a very similar matter from Matthew 18, verses 1 through 14. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called the little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore... Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. 
For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. These are the words of the Lord for us this day. Let us turn in now to our time of our special music to reflect on these truths.
Would you pray with me? Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words I speak this day be glorifying to you. I pray that your spirit would come upon each of us here and those who watch online, that we might learn and know what it is to better follow you in our lives. May you teach us, grow us, enliven us with these truths. And ask these things in your holy name. Amen. Well, this is it. We're at the end. We've crossed the finish line after today. The culmination of our children series. Children's church. Kids in church. And today it's about the church. We've talked about focusing our lives and our mission to have a component of children in mind in all that we do. That's how we began this journey. Wrapping our heads around how God conceives of children. How we should think of children. And how that should always be a facet of how we as Christians operate in the world. That we can't really be the church if we are not raising the next generation. Then we shifted and thought of how this works. How God designed it principally to operate. We talked about the core nexus in which God does this. The family. The responsibilities of being a parent. The joy that that brings. But the obligation that it, that is. And how we as a church should help raise up parents to raise up kids. To help parents teach kids. But then we move forward one more step. We talked about community for two weeks. How God never intended in some ways for us to do these things alone. And in many ways in this dark and difficult world with sin that is still prevalent, causing hardships for many beyond their control, we as a community are called from Christ to help raise children. The ones that aren't ours. Whether we've had our own and they are raised and gone and now we have more time to help others or at the same time that we have our own children and can help those who are not as well off as us. That there is a social obligation involved in Christianity. And so today we're going to put a pin in it all in some ways. And we come to these very last difficult but important words from Christ. And I'm going to pop, hopefully, this last bubble that might remain in some people's minds that Christianity is about you. I've talked about this a lot. It's a common theme in a lot of my sermons that in some ways I'm pushing back against a way of being a Christian that's been popular for the past 30, 40, 100, 200 years. That's this enlightened, post-modern sense of Christianity that comes to call that says, just have a prayer sometime in your life, repenting of sins, then maybe kind of go to church, make a good list of the things you're supposed to do, and then you're a Christian. Give money here and there when they ask you to, sure, but that's basically it, you know. Work on yourself. Work on your personal faith, you know, make sure that you develop who you are, and that's it, really. That's all good, but that's not all. That's a very important part. We are all supposed to grow in who we are as Christians, in who Christ is alive in us, to challenge ourselves, to step away from sins, sure. But Jesus had a lot to say about what we're supposed to do with the rest of our lives, with all of our time and energies. What we do at home, what we do at work, because that takes up a lot of time throughout the week besides those moments of personal Christian morality. And so today Jesus has some words to reflect upon and Paul took those words and he kind of ran with it even further. That's what our Romans reading was. And they both have to do with this phrase stumbling. Whether or not we as Christians are being thoughtful about how we are helping others come to know who Jesus is. Whether the church has done a good job of being a place that represents Christ, that helps people come to Christ, or has unfortunately caused others to stumble and have been harder to find Christ. Whether we, in our personal lives, are a people that help or stumble. Because we have to be conscious of this fact. 
We cannot just assume that everything will wind up fine, that this isn't something important. Because Jesus had very, very strong language when it came to this fact. He had very strong language when he came to speak about how others stumble or about how you stumble, and very in particular whether you are helping little ones come to know who Christ is. These are some of the most graphic, you could say, words. They should make you kind of go, ew. Jesus told me to do what? That's in the Bible? Cutting off a hand? Ripping out an eye? Wrapping a millstone around my neck and drowning in the ocean? Yeah, it's in there. Because he's trying to get your attention. He's talking to his disciples, the ones who have walked with him. And this is nearing the end. This is in chapter 18 of Matthew. This isn't like new disciples. These are the ones that have been walking with him for two, three years now. You'd think they'd know better. And they come up to him and they go, who's the greatest in the kingdom? They've missed the point. They're losing sight of the goal. They're still wrapped up in this messianic push of conquering the world, of subduing everyone else, of having it be their way, when it's supposed to be Christ's way, which is the opposite way, which is the foolish way, the way that doesn't make sense by the world's priorities, by the way we would think things need to be done. And so he has to get graphic with them. The same way, potentially, he has to get graphic with us. Because we get comfortable. We've walked with Christ for how many years? Some of you maybe like 70 that's a long time. The longer you walk, there's two ways this can go. You, some of us grow in lots of Christian ways, but there's blind spots, things that we get stuck in routines and fail to notice, not because we're intentionally wanting harm to others, not because in our hearts we want violence or neglect, but because we get stuck in routine. We get stuck in a mode that makes it easier for us to forget about some details here and there. We pick the parts that make sense to us, and we grab hold of those, and we grow in those, and that's good. But sometimes Jesus needs to come along and slap you in the face. He needs to slap us and say, hey, wake up. There's things that need to be done. There's little lives back there that are important. Do you care? There's little lives across the street, up the road. Little children that walk these roads at weird times of the day, without a parent or supervision. Single moms and single dads trying to raise children. People that have little hope in these neighborhoods. Hello, are you listening? That's what Jesus is saying. Because if we are not being a people that help, what are we doing? If we're focusing on making ourselves greater, better. We need to make our church have more people in it. We need a bigger budget, bigger programs just so we can say that we're a good church that is surviving and growing for the sake of being a church that's growing, who cares? There's no point to that. The point should be reaching out into the lives of others and being a place that welcomes, being a place that helps. Because for so long, in so many various and different ways, the church and the popular mind of society is not the place to go to learn about Christ. We'll listen to things online, or we'll talk about it in some small groups here and there. I can get my Christianese from whatever pastor I want online, and if you're watching, keep watching, that's great. But that's not the point. Who goes to church? What is the church? Who are we? And why do people potentially not want to bother? Because they don't find Christ there. Because they don't feel it there. They don't know it's there either. Because it's not shown to them. It's not revealed to them. How did people come to know who Christ was? Two ways. The first of which is that he went to them. He walked out all the way to them, like this. He goes out, and he walked all the way out, and he said, Hi, how are you? I'm Jesus. What's going on in your life? You having troubles? Do you need help? Great. He came to them, all the way to them. He didn't say, Hey, 
I'll be in Galilee. If you need me, make sure you come and see me. No. He walked into Samaria. He walked everywhere he could. He went to them. And the second way was word of mouth. People said, hey, have you heard about this Jesus guy? He does some crazy things. In fact, I heard that when his disciples asked him who's the best in the kingdom, he took a little kid and said he was the best. Weird, right? Yeah, weird. Because we have a message that's different from everything out there. And it should be. But we need to go out there. And we need to spread the word of mouth to tell others. Because if we're not, I would challenge us that we're being the stumbling block. That we should in some ways get out of the way and let Christ do what Christ needs to be done. That we're just a lovely brick building that does nothing. That's the challenge. And in so many other ways, the words we speak, the things we do in our lives day to day, the ways we talk to our spouses, the ways we talk to our loved ones, our children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews, if you don't have children of your own, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids, great-great-great-grandkids, anyone, maybe? I don't know. Possibly. The way we interact with the people on the street when we pass by them, or how we interact when we're down at Giant Eagle getting some groceries, and we see someone having a difficult time, or taking a bit longer to pull money out of their pocket because they're not quite certain if they can afford everything in their cart. The children who will be soon going to school and may not have things they need. Well, thankfully, our church was generous in some ways to reach out to help and provide those things. You took a step of not being a stumbling block, but instead being a help. And I encourage you to volunteer for that, to do things that show the love of Christ in the world. It is a deep and powerful obligation in our lives to make sure that we don't cause others to stumble. And in many ways, we don't allow ourselves to stumble. But the deeper, wonderful truth is this as well, that as difficult and challenging as these passages are to hear from Paul, who tells his community, hey, stop leveling yourselves, stop judging each other, look at your own lives. From Jesus, who says, cut things off, if you're going to cause you to stumble. Is this truth as well? This is the same Jesus who welcomes each and every one into his loving arms. This is the same Jesus who went and died for these same disciples who asked who the greatest was. For them, that offered them grace. And he knew these people when he called them. He knew you when he called you. These idle men, 12 randos, some fishermen, some tax collectors, not the up-and-up people, not the educated. But he chose them knowing who they are and the way they might stumble and fall. And he knew that they'd go on to do great things because he'd help them do it. You don't have to rely on your own strength. You don't have to go, okay, well, this is causing me to stumble. I'm going to completely get rid of it. That's not really what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, recognize you have difficulties and find a way to help it. I'm the way to help it. And in many ways, if you want to stop working on your struggles or struggling with temptations and issues, go help someone else. It's amazing how you can have little time to dwell on your sinful needs when you don't have time on your hands to do it. It's amazing the way that some of the passions we have or difficulties that we have can slightly disappear when we follow Christ in helping others. Being the people of God is a reviving, rejuvenating, holy, passionate work. Your lives will change. You'll see things done that you never thought possible. Things will get greater, bigger, powerful. Lives will change when you embrace these truths. So the culmination in many ways for this sermon series is this. Wake up. I want you to wake up. I want you to know that there's work to be done and that Christ is already doing it. The question is whether you'll join him. 
whether you'll take the time to reflect on the ways that you stumble and fall, but know that Christ is there to pick you up. So that way you can be there for someone else when they stumble and fall, to help pick them up. Because that's the truth. Christ is there for you in all your struggles and problems, health, finances, well-being. He's there to help you. And in all those things, even if they crumble and fall apart, the truth is you don't need them. You have an eternal life with Jesus prepared. You have glory in store for you. So whatever problems you have now are as nothing compared to those truths. So you are free then to go help someone who doesn't know that truth. You are free to give and give freely of all that you have, your time, your energy, your money, your efforts, to help others. And to really think about whether or not your life is a stumbling block for others. Because woe to us if we are. And as this is a sermon series on children, let us not forget that his most passionate words, in some ways, was about whether or not we are helping them. If you are a stumbling block to a child, Jesus is a little concerned. He's passionate about it. I want us to be passionate about it. That's the call not to beat ourselves up, not to think, oh, we're a horrible people or we haven't done well enough or I'm bad, but to think, I want to care for them as much as Jesus cares for them. He loves them so deeply. He cares for each and every one of them despite what they look like, despite how old they are, how well they think, who they are. They could be a Samaritan child or an Israelite child, and Jesus would hug them the same. They can be a child out the street, to a drug addict, or they could be sitting in the front, whoa, Jesus loves them the same. We should be the same passionate people. To hear these words and come away not thinking, oh, how bad we are, but instead think, oh, how much God loves them. I want to help him. I want to join with God in loving them. We should be a people of God. And you can be those people, in every moment of your life, in everything you do, it simply takes a moment to think about it. The challenge is thinking as Christ. So in your lives, week to week, and as we move on from this sermon series, take the challenge to think like Christ. And know that Christ is there for you to do it. Take a moment each day, maybe in the morning, before you've gone off and done anything, and think, what am I going to do today to help another? What am I going to do today to not be a stumbling block to others? Because it's very easy to slip into that gear. Let me tell you. I, I do it all the time. I let my problems, the pain in my body that I shouldn't have as a 30-year-old, but it's there anyway, the Disgruntlement over issues in the world that seem to never get fixed. Children that wake us up at odd times in the morning so we don't sleep well. Allergies and symptoms, all these things that build up. And then it can be very easy to lose your temper. Or to be angry as you're driving. Or to have a bitter look on your face as you're looking and walking down the street or looking and talking to your neighbor. It's easy. I understand that. It's very easy to slip into that mode because the world wants to crush you down. Sin, darkness, wants you to be defeated. It doesn't want you to be a light. It doesn't want you to help. You move past it by knowing that it's not just your light that's shining. You can conquer those things when you pray to God and say, Jesus, I can't do this. And he'll look at you and say, well, you weren't supposed to do it. You're alone. That's the point. I called you to great things because I know you can do it, because I can do it. We can do it. And if you are having a hard time, if you are struggling and prone to stumble that day, well, guess what? I just talked about community for two weeks. Pick up a phone and call someone. When you are lost in your own darkness and anxieties, it's hard to pull yourself out. 
So let a friend help you pull yourself out. We're a community. We're a people of God, and we will do great things in the name of God if we follow Christ, if we let ourselves not succumb to the pressures of this world, if we don't let stabbings, shootings, wars, and issue conquer us because they can't conquer God. They never will. Have hope. Come away impassioned today. Come away knowing things can be done. Little miracles every day. From the phone call to the whisper, just as our offering video told you. Little things can cause great miracles. And there's little things each of us can do. I pray that this week you know that you can do it. That maybe some of those hardships I just mentioned will dissipate for you. But I will give you this warning as well. When you step out doing Christ's work in the world is the moment darkness is going to push as hard as it can on you. The moment this church seeks to do bigger things in its community, to reach out and love, is the moment Satan's going to rear his head and say, I don't want that to happen, and will cause problems. Maybe our boiler will explode. Maybe water will leak everywhere. Who knows? Roof collapse. It's fine. We'll say, all right, we'll deal with it. And we keep doing what we set out to do because in that moment you know you're doing what you're supposed to do. And Christ will be there. And you will do something wonderful in that moment. You can do it. I promise it. I guarantee it. Each of you is a light in the world. Each of you can lift up that light and show another. And each of you can reach out and touch the life of a child, a family, a neighbor, and a friend to invite them to church or just to go into their lives and bring the church to them. And in this way, we can begin to be a people of God, to be the least and thus the best. If you want to know how to be the greatest, it's simply put yourself aside and say, Christ, I need your help. That's how you'll be the greatest. Let us pray. Lord, help us be the church. Help us recognize this deep truth in our lives that we are all changed, that we have been baptized in you. And in this truth, you're alive in us. We have a Holy Spirit to give us strength and knowledge and a direction. Help us not let the darkness in the world and in our own lives crush us, stop us. For that's all it really wants to do. Stop us. So let us just keep moving. Let us charge forward with a passion. Let us be the church. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with me our final hymn and the final time that we'll sing it, well, we'll sing it again eventually, but the final time we'll sing it for a few months at least. Jesus loves me.
Remember that truth. Jesus loves you. It's not just a children's song. It's a hymn, for goodness sake. It was written in some ways for adults, too. Because you're a child of God. You reach loved and cared for. And you can do great things because God's love for you is greater than anything else that this world can throw at you. So go in that love of God the Father. The power and strength of Jesus Christ and the hope and direction of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. Amen.